Awesome. We're live. We're going to be speaking with uh, Crafty Dog. Mark Denny, I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions and hopefully we all learn something from it. I am going to now play the super cool intro, which means in a minute we're going to get started. Here we go. Get the fuck out of bed, bitch. Go. You're finished! Ah, let's get up! Get up, 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 Sweet. Mark, welcome. Welcome. How are you? Woof, woof. Woof, woof. All right, let's get right into it. Is DBMA a Filipino martial arts system? Uh, imperfectly so. What, what, what do you mean by that? If, if we were to limit ourselves to Filipino influences, we would be violating the principles of Filipino martial arts. And what, what principle is that? Well, Filipino martial arts, you know, as you well know, and the audience well knows, is an influence of all these different people and places. There's, you know, there's Chinese, there's Indonesian, there's Malaysian, uh, there's Spanish. You know, it's a, very much a JKD attitude of absorb what is useful. So if I were to reject something because it didn't come from the, to me, via the, uh, from the Philippines to me, I would be violating that absorb what is useful principle. So, you know, for example, simple example, uh, I began in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in 1990 uh, with the Machado brothers, and I brought Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which mod had to be modified according to the needs of Dog Brothers fighting, but that's an influence. Uh, you know, uh, Salty Dog brought the Krabi Krabam. For those not familiar with the name, that's the military weaponry forerunner to the combat ring sport of Muay Thai. Uh, you know, that too is very much a part of you know, what people do in Dog Brothers. It's very much a part of um, a, only the, the base level of Krabi Krabong, but, you know, it's an influence on DBMA. And so, you know, I, I don't claim to be pure Filipino martial arts, but if I did, then I would be violating the absorb what is useful precept. What, what is the last thing that DBMA absorbed? The last thing? As far as systems go, like you said that you began your journey in jujitsu. What was the last, if we can categorize it into a system? Well, I, I said this is the most recent? Yes, sir. Is, um, I'd probably say uh, the Piper from Lloyd the Young. And, and what from that did you absorb? Um, Piper's, you know, Lloyd and I worked together very closely for a couple of years. Um, at one point, we were even talking about blending our knife systems into one system. We had a logo, and, and we were going to call it uh, Rapid Transients Weapon Craft, and we had a logo and everything, and you know, just an indication of how close the working relationship was. Um, and the Piper system is uh, it's very distinctive. And in, in my analytical framework, I like to begin with what is the problem to be solved? And so what is the problem that uh, Piper looks to solve is basically a system in its origins, not in the work of Lloyd, but in the study of criminals. It's a criminal system, either for the streets or for prison. And so it is about using the knife against prey. Um, and, you know, so that's, uh, but what it does have, and I found, you know, is an idiom of movement that is very distinctive. It's a blend of Nguni stick fighting, the, the movements that they have, the knob at the end of the stick. And so when they're moving like this with the tip of the stick relatively stationary, that starts becoming some of the, the knife movements. You know, yeah. you, 
you know, people who are stu students of movement can see that. Um, you know, Lloyd explained he has a, a DVD project out there somewhere where he goes into how the Nguni stick fighting, which would include the Zulus, um, became part of the Piper idiom of movement. The other part is that you had uh, a sea lot influence of sailors on Dutch ships coming across mm. uh, the Indian Ocean to South Africa from the Indonesians, Indonesia being a Dutch colony for a goodly period of time. And so there's a sea lot influence there as well. But the, the movement is different from movement that I had seen elsewhere. And so um, one of the things I like to say with DBMA is smuggling concepts across the frontiers of style. And so I wanted <laughs> to say things um, from that movement. And another way in which Lloyd influenced me is um, I was already a fan, but Lloyd's understanding of John Boyd and uh, John Boyd's theories ran deeper than mine. And so uh, John Boyd was the guy who developed the OODA loop. Right. And so one of the things that Boyd says is change in height, speed, and direction. And that's I think that's pretty deep. And so I now that improves my way of analyzing what happens in a stick fight. Boyd was a fighter, for those who don't know, Boyd was a fighter pilot in the Korean War. He was an ace and he was mm -hmm. shooting down the enemy's planes, even though they were uh, faster and had tighter plane radiuses. But he had other understandings and so he was an ace and he became the top instructor, the instructor around which the top gun school was built. And so as the, the instructor there, all the young Val Kilmers, all the young Tom Cruises would come in and he would say, OK, we're going to go up tomorrow, stay thin or bet on it. We're going to start with you on my tail. Here's me and you're going to start on my tail. And within 60 seconds, I will have you solved. And in many years, you never lost. So it goes the story. Um, and so the same, you know, so the same engagements of, you know, of a dog fight are kind mm -hmm. of like the engagements of sticks looking to sure. find that opening and so forth. And so, you know, that's been an influence. I, I've changed the system. You know, I've taken the parts of it that serve my purposes. My analytical model now places great emphasis on always beginning with what is the problem to be solved? I, I have a problem. Maybe you, uh, you can you can help me solve this. Um the, the ideal, if we can have an ideal position to attack from, philosophically, generally speaking, is from the rear, the flank. How do you, do you have any tips as to how we gain that advantage? Because there's a lot of footwork models and a lot of uh, theoretical concepts about how we actually do that. What are the difficulties in attacking and getting that ideal tactically advantageous angle to attack from the rear in, from your experience in stick fighting? I would put it like this. The, one of the things that happens with, in the Filipino martial arts is that a lot of people, they, want, they learn how to blaze the stick. And there's a lot of people who can blaze the stick really well. But, um, but I believe most times the speed of the fight is the speed of the feet. One guy blazes his stick, the other guy takes one step, he's out of reach. So the, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, you know, so, and, and, you know, one of the operating principles of DBMA is primal probabilities first. How do you deal with a Mongo who is sw swinging hard with aggression and just coming at you? And there can be a lot of people and they can do, have great skill in the drills, but if they can't handle that, they can't handle that. Does that manifest in how you teach? Because I think that's really... And this is where I'm headed. So one of the DBMA principles is what I call the one-for-one -one relationship, is to slow down the speed of the stick, the knife, the empty hand, to the speed of the feet, to what I call the one-for-one -one relationship. For every movement of the stick or the knife or you know, the empty hand, there's also a movement of the foot. And so for most people, this messes with their ego tremendously because they're no longer as good as they thought they were. They realize they're not as good as they thought they were. Right. And so when I'm in a playful mood, I sometimes call it puff toad syndrome. The, the toad puffs up his air sac to look big and dangerous and look at me, blaze my sticks. I'm dangerous. But then they discover, well, maybe you're not that dangerous. 
because you can't move at the same time. And so it's a tremendous, it really messes with the ego. And as a teacher, I love to foment that process by the training and the drills that I offer, which in my opinion, go deep into the coordination matrix that for the person who can not take themselves seriously and slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And they take the time till they get it. It's like, Oh, why did I make that so hard? It is simple. It is efficient. Something growing right. on it many years ago when I began with him, that would be 1982 as he's talking about the origins of the word Kali. And I know for many folks, that's a controversial Adventure. thing. Yeah, for sure. But the way I remember him explaining it is it was a combination of Komut Lihut, the K-A of Komut and the Li of Lihut, meaning the study of movement. Right. That basically uh, one of the explanations is by extending the length of the limb with the weapons, putting one more joint into it, you get greater feedback to your neurological system and it becomes a way of efficiently learning to move better. The Kali is simply moving better. Yeah. No, I agree and with that. Once you have that one for one relationship, of course you can do additional strikes per step, but yeah. there needs to be a foundation of the one for one movement. And so that for example, that's something that I teach in the uh the Dos Tricas material. And so the what? It's a subsystem of DBMA, dos trichas. And the word trichas is my idea. I have a strange sense of humor. And this, it came about from my uh, blending uh, the Krabi Krabong that uh, Salty Dog Arlen was bringing to our fighting and Kali. So you had three Ks. And there was the Filipino independence movement with the initials KKK. But in the American context, that has a very different meaning. Very different. <laughs> very different. <laughs> And so, you know, I, um, so instead of, so basically I took three Ks and then I started playing with the sound of it and I speak Spanish. And so three Ks, three Ks, three Ks. So the Q-U-E is the K, it is pronounced K in Spanish and the T-R-I meaning three. And so it, that's my way, a funny way of saying the three Ks, but the meaning of the name <laughs> is the blending of Kale and Corbi Corban. It's very Filipino of you, by the way. To, to be playful with words. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and okay. so the, the Dos Trica system, you know, it's one of my DVDs. And so that is also uh, where I, for fight application, it's highly fight applicable material. I actually filmed the instructional portion of that material before I had fight footage of it because I knew that we would be generating fight footage of it because DBMA videos are based upon, you see a oh, yeah. fight, that's how confident I was of it. Yeah. And so, um, how to put this here? Most Caucasian music is 4 4. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Right? However, so I see it, Kali is in 6 4. So, here, let, let's, let's break this down simply. I'm going to go a little bit slower here so the people can get it. One, two, three, four. That's the basic, most music, as I jokingly say, Caucasian music is in four, four. There's four beats to a rhythmic unit with the first one being more emphasized than the others. So at that same speed, then you can put in the, instead of, that's quarter notes. Four quarter notes give you one measure. But if you put in the, um, the eighth notes, there's eight of them in the four beats. So it becomes one and two and three and four and instead of just one, two, three, four. One and two and three and four. And on the other hand, Kali is in six four. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So, so look at all your six counts. One, two, three, one, two, three. Have a sure. six, face it. So rhythmically, you have three strikes. To, so most people operate in four, four, open eight. <clears throat> <clears throat> And it can be done in a speed metal kind of a way, hard, strong, and fast. I'm not making fun of it. You know, somebody who's bit and aggressive and, you know, hits with power and moves their feet with it, you got your hands full. Absolutely. Yep. But the advantage that I seek to obtain is because of my years training in what some people make fun of as the martial arts and crafts. All the, you know, I think into more rhythmically. And with rhythm, you have timing. And with timing, you can you can beat speed. Are, are you compromising power 
by adding I, more. I don't, I don't have to be. I can be compensating for a power differential, but I'm not compromising it. Okay, I understand. I'm not giving up whatever power I might have. You know, but you know, on the other hand, you know, if a guy's going big, big and strong, and you will see this, and if you mm -hmm. can't deal with that, that's the right. primal probability that comes first. Did but you did you go, go through a? I'm sorry. Did you go through a learning process whereby you did the opposite? Uh, like, did you go through the opposite of what you propose to be a good way now? Like, did you do the what? What, what was the term you used? The uh, martial arts and crafts. No, no, something about the stick swishing. Oh, um, I mean, like, did you go through a phase of your learning, maybe in the initial phases, where? the priorities were different than where you have them laid out today because your, your primal okay, probability. I think I, I think I understand your question. And, you know, so um, as I mentioned a little while ago, I begin with what is the problem to be solved? Right. What was the problem that I was looking to solve and coming to the Filipino martial arts or right? martial arts in general. And then, you know, what led me specifically to Filipino martial arts as the center of what I do. So relating to your original question is the yes. DMA of Filipino system. It's center, it's core is Filipino, but these other things are brought in. So my starting point was growing up uh, in, on, in New York City at a very violent time. Street crime was very much a part of my growing up. You know, um, I could tell many stories. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, a couple of simple ones, getting beaten up on the stairs at school. You know, I, I was thrown out of a private school and I wound up in a public school that was 20% white and I got beaten up on the stairs my second day there. Um, you know, I was flirting with this black girl in the lunchroom and uh, I didn't realize she was the girlfriend of the leader of the lesbian gang. And so the lesbian gang was waiting for me as I was headed out the lunchroom. And I had no clue. <laughs> and, this, yeah. you know, this new friend, friend of mine, uh, you know, Luis, Puerto Rican guy. The school is like 40 black, 40 Puerto Rican, and then like 18 white, 2% Asian or whatever. In a rough mix there. You know, and about 10% of the school was using heroin. Um, what? And, you know, so you say, you know, Lucille and her girls are waiting for you outside. And I'm like, they're girls, what? You know, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't take it seriously because they were girls. He says, they raped a girl on the stairs last year with a Coke bottle. You need to take this seriously. So, you know, these are the kind of things that, you know, like dealing with, you know, junkies stalking you on the subway at two in the morning, you know, in the Bronx or something. It's like, okay, um, you know, you learn to like, okay, if I'm getting off at 116th Street, I need to get off in the second car because that's where the stairs are. If the, step I, the stop I got on, the stairs are at the last car of the train, and I get off at the last car of the train. I can now easily be separated from the stairs when I get off. So during as the train's moving along, I move yeah. from the, the rear car to the second car, so I'm by the stairs. It's that kind of an environment. Uh, and there's other stories as well. And do you think those? Do you think those origin stories um, are because I've heard similar from great instructors and i consider you a great instructor you're, you're certainly legendary in many people's books do you think those kinds of origin stories are a necessity to greatness because we hear from datu yeah, kelly it Warren, depends on what is what is the problem to be solved so you know just to sort of uh, tell one more little story in this context okay. Um, okay. i um Graduated from the university in a December because of the years I dropped out and I was a construction carpenter and it was during those years that at between jobs I would jump on my motorcycle and ride down to Mexico. And so I had this open semester before starting up law school, so I did a semester in a Mexican law school because I wanted to prepare for international law and I wanted to take my Spanish to more grown-up level. And after that semester was over, my buddy Luis uh, from Mexico City, I we went down to Chiapas, Mexico, which is the state that borders Guatemala. And to make a long story short, we picked up two girls. I've told this story you know, a couple of times in interviews and so forth. No need to go into it now. But the short version is we picked up these two American girls who were dressed in an American way, which fired up the locals. And they figured that they were hookers. And they tried grabbing the girl that was with Luis. And so there was a two against us, so get four, two of us, two, Luis and I against the four of them. And I had a belt buckle that was like uh, 
brass knuckles and we ran to the they, we ran to the police and they had car antennas and coke bottles. The cop on duty ran away because he didn't have a gun because he was a transit cop. So all he had was a screwdriver, which he uses to remove the license plates to enforce pipe parking violations. And we barricaded ourselves in the police station as they're trying to come in the front door. And then as we're going over the, out the back window, the police arrive in force and we're thrown in prison for three days. It's a great story, but that's the condensed version. <laughs> and um, so out of things like, it was like, great, everything ended well. You know, as a practical minded person, I did have that backup belt buckle in my back pocket for just in cases. But um so, you know, when I got back to school, I said, like, you know, I need to, you know, get proper training. And so my last year of law school, I did a semester of Fujiao Pai with uh, Paul Vizio, who became the PKA world champion at the time he was the U.S. champion. And uh, then I did a year of Taekwondo while I was lawyering down in Washington, D.C. And then I got out to California and happened to meet this guy on the beach. I saw him doing Kung fu movements. He says, oh, this is a modified Wing Chun. I said, oh, I've heard Wing Chun. That's supposed to be pretty cool. And so he told me about the Kali Academy. And that's, I walked in there and I said, I saw the sticks and the knives and everything that people were doing there. I said, ah, I have found what I'm looking for. The stuff I've done prior to that was, well, this is all, this is what's at hand now. But it, I know that this is not what I'm looking for. But when I walked in and I saw the collie, I said, ah, this is what I'm looking for. This resonated for me to solve the problems that I had had as a New Yorker, you know, the problems that I had dealing with those four guys looking to drag the girl off from us, you know, down in, Ch in uh, San Cristobal de las Casas in, in Chiapas, Mexico. And so what is the problem to be solved? Most martial arts is about not about that. Basically, as I organize it, something that I like is um, I've done a lot of reading over the years in evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology, and uh, scientists of great influence on, on me is a man by the name of Conrad Lorenz. I named my son Conrad after him. Hmm. And he speaks of, he spoke of three types of aggression, territory, hierarchy, reproduction. Hunting, he did not define as a aggression because of inter and not intra species but human criminal behavior is that of a predator and it is intra species so as i articulate things there's territory hierarchy reproduction male female and defense of the young or predatory criminal certain the criminal behavior and most martial arts is about what we could call young male ritual hierarchical combat two men of equal size that an agreed upon time and place and agreed upon rules competing and by very definition, the loser, they are with, if they're in a hierarchy, they're in the same social unit. And by very definition, that social unit, the tribe, the pack, becomes weaker if the loser is last point of damage. Uh, evolutionary push, the Darwinian logic, is that the loser should not be damaged as long as the hierarchy issue that in question was settled. Right. Uh, but it's not my interest. My interest was dealing with predators. And so, for you know, when you're dealing with predators, weapons are part of the equation. So for me, the logic of the Filipino arts was more responsive to what I was looking to solve. I'd like to explore an element of what you just noted about if uh, two entities within the same unit have a, a, have a hierarchical clash and it weakens the structure of the whole if there is you know, injury or, or damage, let's call it damage, uh, to the losing party. Do you suppose that's why so many Filipino martial arts systems don't engage in full count contact fighting or sparring? Does it not um, make sense? That I, 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 I want to evade part of that question there. I don't want to get involved in saying, well, I think Filipinos do this or that because of this or that. I mean, you know, I've only spent one month in the Philippines grand total. And, you know, I'm talking so, about Filipino martial arts, not just Filipinos. Okay. okay. Um, Why don't more so people this, spar and fight? So, well, uh, the way that I've organized it is that, um, you know, at least here in America, there were the stories of the death matches. And, so, and there's also the question of the gene pools that different martial arts attract. People who want to fight, who want to compete, tend to go into 
uh, football, rugby, jujitsu, bas- you know, uh, boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, jujitsu, M- and then when it came on the scene, MMA. That's the gene pool, and that the gene pool that we, um, the Filipino martial arts attracted tended to be people who wanted to develop skill in the weapons and therefore look dangerous. You know what I, you know what I sometimes playfully call the puff toad syndrome. And Filipinos being smaller in the American, you know, on the whole in the American culture, it's like, yeah, I want to look dangerous. And I'm not, you know, like if I'm a 140 pound Filipino, I'm certainly not going out for the football team. You know, whereas a guy who, you know, you know, the wrestling team, you know, I'm, I'm, there's always, I'm speaking in, in very big generalities here. So I'm, I'm just sort of speaking in tendencies. And of course, someone said, what about this? What about that? Uh, yes, you don't have to worry about that on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, but for anybody who's listening, I'm saying, you know, like, sure. of course, there's plenty of exceptions. Right, right. But we're talking about big sweeping generalities here. And so the gene pool, uh, when I met Eric of the Filipino martial arts, tended to people who wanted to have the, the, the movement and the look and to look dangerous. Right. And the belief that to test it was too dangerous, that it would result in death. And so I think this is part of um, one of the key ingredients of the Dog Brothers is that we found a way of going about it that didn't yield death and that was uh, had surprisingly little lasting damage. And that has to do with the, the code and the values of the Dog Brothers. You know, what are the, mag- what are the magic words say? Among them, uh, no judges, no referees, no trophies. One rule only, be friends at the end of the day. Uh, our goal is that no one spends the night in the hospital. Our goal is that everyone leaves with the IQ with which he came. However, only you are responsible for you. And so with that, that is the value of members of the same tribe preparing each other. So there's a certain sense there's something very Filipino about the values. If we are in the same tribe and I smash you because of some my penis is bigger than your penis kind of a disagreement. When we go to get, deal, defend our territory, our land, women, and children against the neighboring tribe, we're going to be worse for it. And if I don't test you enough or you don't test me enough, when we go to stand together against that neighboring tribe in defense of our land, women, and children, the tribe will be weaker for it. And so this is, I think, uh, one uh, key ingredient to the success of the dog brothers is that we don't keep score that it is not it, we take it out of the uh, the category of being a hierarchy fight you know right. my, you know most fighting you know you know, you know we tie or you know whatever it is you lose you're out right. and then there's this elimination process to get to the peak of the pyramid the but champion, you keep an count of the number of fights right i mean that? um Dog brothers, fighters, they keep account of the fights they've been in, not whether or not they've won it, right? Because I often hear of people well, saying, if you, learn from, and you learn from the fight, but, you know, whether you win or lose, you're not eliminated. Right. Whereas, you know, you, know, there, you, know, you, you think of most of the competitions, it's a process of selection. It's a process of determining hierarchy. But because we're not determining hierarchy, we are simply working to all of us grow. That allows us to have a very violent fight that at the same time is, is, does not have uh, unnecessary destructiveness. So a, a part of why I brought you in here was a conversation. I, I posted something on my Facebook page that not a lot of people actually understand the contributions of the Dog Brothers to the greater Filipino martial arts community. Um, what do you suppose is the greatest contribution of the Dog Brothers to the Filipino martial arts community? I, I'd rather leave that to other people. You know, the greatest. You know, you know, I, you know, I, 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 um, you have an idea. Maybe you... Well, I, I, just, I think one of the contributions is okay. that simply you can do this without dying. <laughs> That's big. <laughs> That's pretty big. <laughs> and uh, we provided a model of how to do that. Right. You know, that friends at the end of the day model is, uh, I think, is a very powerful one. And, uh, there, you know, there's other themes that could be, you know, mingled in there as well. Um, are you familiar with who Carl Jung is? 
Carl Young. Yes. Yes. Um, a, a, a little bit. A little All bit. All right. So, so, you know, he started out as a contemporary of Sigmund Freud and then developed his own school of psychology. Deep man, brilliant man. And um, one of the things he did was to study different cultures around the world that had not had contact with other cultures. And to, he, he spotted deep, consistent themes. In other words, the same theme in the mythology of this culture and in the mythology of another culture, the same underlying themes are there without these cultures having ever known of each other. And so, you know, out of this, he sought to discern deep patterns of the nature of human, of humanity. And um, one of the things he noticed was that all cultures had some sort of initiation ritual for boys to become men. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, some of the people who've taken his ideas and, and grown with them is that um, in the modern world, we don't have initiation rituals. And so in a certain sense, so for some people, the Dar Brothers, it's about, you know, the, the initiation ritual is the older men of the tribe telling the young man, you are today, you are a man, we find you a worthy member of the tribe, a worthy warrior of the tribe. Right. You, that cannot be received from the father. And in the modern life, you know, the father goes off to the office, the boy is raised by the women, the pe or the women in particularly grade school, you know, teacher school environments are increasingly feminized. Um, you know, the values, you know, and radically so in recent years, uh, and trends there are not favorable. And so it becomes very hard for a boy to discern what it is to be a man and to receive validation. And so because the Dog Brothers uh, we handle ourselves in a way that um, somebody coming up, that we're somebody from whom these boys, you know, these people seeking initiation, affirmation, whatever you want to call it, uh, it they want to receive it from us. And so they put themselves to the standards of our group. And so you learn to um, fight in the dog brother way. And, you know, so if you look at the credo of the Dog Brothers, everybody knows higher consciousness through harder contact, but that's only mm -hmm. the second half of it. The complete one goes like this. The greater the dichotomy, the profounder the transformation. Higher consciousness through harder contact. The dichotomy is that an equal measure in, uh, to which you, in, equal to the measure in which you go to the aggressive state, in equal measure you must activate your watcher. because you are there is no referee you are responsible for what you do in a professional fight i smash until the referee pulls me right. off you can't do that in a weaponry fight because you will have damage well is there a consequence for when that happens well that, that's a separate question here but you know so and but you know so that because you are responsible for your own behavior you do not delegate it to a referee that so an equal to get this far in aggression, you have to get an equal measure to activate your watcher so that you are conscious and responsible for not going too far. And that do it, the, the extent to which you do that, that is a transformational experience. And to the extent which you cultivate that within yourself, you become somebody who can step forward with, you know, with judgment and morality. You have the practical sense of what you realistically can or can't do because you have operated in the context of the dog brother state. You are not overwhelmed by adrenaline the way someone would be who has no experience in the adrenaline yeah. state. And at the same time, not only are you really good at being aggressive, but it is anchored in the learning of the adrenal state, which is the deepest learning, how to stay conscious of what you're doing and to exercise right. judgment, even though you are in the adrenal state. That's powerful. It's huge. That's huge. And and one of one of the telltale signs that I, I see of, of an experience whenever I observe people stick fighting is how well they can manage that adrenal state. You can tell that if I mean, I, I've seen some some matches where there was a clear discrepancy in skill, power and size and the bigger person wasn't able to control. And, and that's I mean, it, it was it was sad to see. 
But you're absolutely right. Like I, who was it that told me that uh, a far a, a car should only go as fast as its ability to stop itself, meaning to say the engine needs to be proportionate to the braking power of that vehicle. So it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, you talk a lot about morality and and these lines. Let's talk about um, let's let's talk about the responsibility and the moral lines that you draw when you teach knife work to the public. Can you talk to us about that? Nice segue. Um, huh? <laughs> that was a very good segue. Huh. Um, let me start with uh, something uh, that Poonam Gregor related to me. Oh. And I, know, I know you're interested to him. Oh, yes, I am. He told me of a, you could call it a meditation, you might call it an on thing on thing, uh, that he did. And one night he was woken from a sleep. This is when he, you know, he's with his wife and his children, young children, and he's woken up from a sleep and he instantly jumped up with a knife in his hand. And we attributed that to this uh, on thing on thing training that he had been doing. And he stopped doing that because you know, the knife calls to something very dark. You know, I've never had to apply something. I've never had to apply a knife on a human being. Uh, but I've had deep conversation with people who have. And it's, uh, it's not a conversation that such people enter into easily. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's something that needs to be approached with a certain sensitivity I understand but, yeah. you know they'll speak of feeling his life pass th through the blade into you you know or things like that and that it is it's perhaps the most intimate thing they've ever done or you'll, you'll hear phrases like this and mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to go into the specifics here I'm guessing you know the case to which I'm referring but there was a case of somebody uh on the East coast who his friend was being beaten up by a large yeah. bouncer and yeah. he comes in out of, you know, and this is a person with a proper life. You know, he was at school for, you know, very professional career and, you know, had mm -hmm. a, a, a girlfriend, a fiance, somebody whose life was in order. And, um, he's like, my friend is being up, beaten up by this large bouncer. I would help. And he'd been doing knife training and he steps in and he does a C cut on the big guy in the leg and he cuts the femoral. And even though they threw the big guy, you know, took him to the hospital and they poured lots of blood through him, you know, 15 hours of, you know, blood loss later, he was dead. And, that, you know, there's a trial and this guy, hard time and, you know, terrible story. But he had the physical skill to solve the physical problem, but it had not been anchored to the judgment. <clears throat> I mean, in the heart as best I can tell, was was a good heart. I am going to save my friend from being beaten up. But that wasn't enough. You, you know, you understand what I'm trying to say? And so, I do understand. And so, um, blade culture is very different. And there, there's a story, perhaps I'll tell you, you know, when the camera's off. Um, but blade cultures are very different. And um, there was, um, I want to be vague here. There was a Filipino teacher who was one of the first who was teaching knife versus on openly, knife versus unarmed. You know, sort of, you know, when I started, knife material was always empty hand versus knife or knife versus knife. But very, never did you see knife versus empty hand. And, uh, and this teacher was teaching that. And this other teacher came and sat down next to me. And he said to me, what do you think? And I was very impressed with this material. I, I, I thought and think a, a very deep block of material. And I said, wow, you know, it seems really deadly. And he says to me, ah, these guys are no good. And I was surprised on two levels. Knife people tend to be very polite about other knife people, particularly when they're in the same room. Uh, especially when they're in the same room, yeah, but typically not. And the other one is that that's what he actually thought. So I was surprised in two ways. And I said, what do you mean? He says, ah, 
they're no good. All their attacks are from in front. Oh, there you go. And um, why do you suppose he he he? And, and so the that. knife culture, you know. So basically, so what what is it that you're teaching with knife? If you know, like frankly, if you, all the surveillance footage that we see, how often do we see both both men with knives out and having a duel? Very rare. Very rare. We do see it because you know we're we're junkies in these things, and we you know want to. There's something to be important to be gleaned from studying these things. Mm -hmm. You know, we do in the social media and all the surveillance cameras. There's now a whole bunch more of this material available for study than there used to be. But uh, in point of fact, it's actually very rare. You know, if you're uh, particularly here in America, deadly force. You know, well, it, you know, most people are going to go to the gun. When are you going to prefer a knife over a gun? You know, the, you know that that's a question in its own right yeah but so not, knife really becomes about you know is, <clears throat> as this teacher said they're no good all their tax firm from in front for him a knife is simply a way to kill somebody right and so if you are so basically you are teaching the, the skill of a kill and so to whom do you want to teach that do you want to teach it to some young hot you know so young males tend to be hot blooded and to, you know, the part of the brain that exercises judgment is not fully developed. Right. And in uh, major portions of American society, you have young men who are uh, grow up fatherless. You know, and, you know, what happens to males when they are don't receive the guidance of a father? They tend to have a much higher percentage of life and crime. There's right. a wonderful documentary many years ago that I forget how it came about, but they had a herd of elephants where the older males were in one, you know, they, you know, the young males didn't have older bull elephants around and all oh, this, they're, they're fighting and they're raping the females and this and that. And then somebody had the insight to you know, mix back in the older bull elephants and then, you know, elephant social harmony was restored. And so we have a very, unhealthy culture at present um yeah it's uh, i mean you know i i go on tangents and you know so here comes one right now but uh something that i notice you know again going to the framework of evolutionary biology evolutionary psychology is that in the last 50 years or so, so basically since the development of the pill we have had a separation of sex and reproduction and because it takes longer and longer to get your life in order before you are in a position to get married and raise children, you need more education and so forth. We have this interregnum of 15, 20 years between the onset of puberty and the age at which reproduction begins. And also notice that we now do not have, we do not have babies at a rate to maintain our population level worldwide. We're seeing demographic. Yeah contractions and you know that's a whole thing in its own right but for what i'm keying on right now is what is done with the sexual energy during those 15 20 years when there's no you know when there's no reproduction and the years that that drive is at its strongest it imprints on you know what does it imprint on and you know and it seems to me that um you know, the, the differences in, in, you know, the male way of about sex and, you know, there's pl plenty of overlap and, you know, in the, mm -hmm. in the female way of sex is that, uh, you know, like, hey, let's just have sex. It uh, feels good. You know, there, there's um, something that doesn't ground there and that installs deep patterns that, you know, where there becomes instead of uh, a coming together between male and female. There becomes a competition, or you know, something that's unhealthy <laughs> develops, and you know, I think there's a, you know, a lot of our sort of social disharmony, you know, that that might be worth looking at. And then you also throw in the measure of, uh, I think there's been something like a 40 to 50 percent decline in the average testosterone level of the American male over the last 40 to 50 years. And so, you know, where does that come from? Hormones, uh, you know, antibiotics or, you know, you know, plastics, you know, chemicals in the environment. Who knows? I mean, you know, you know, these are things people discuss, but 
all of these things may make for, uh, you know, very unhealthy social yeah. relations. And so in that context to say, here, I'm going to show you how to kill with a knife. Uh, yeah, that seems dangerous. But we've often heard of, of folks who don't have the ideal upbringing being saved by martial arts, you know? Absolutely. But those martial arts are usually not about efficiently killing with a knife. Right. And so to me, there's, there seems to be uh, an issue with how knife is taught, under what framework it's taught, and how we train it out. Because there, blade culture can be dark, and unfortunately, a lot of people use that as a marketing tool. Yes. And, you know, and, you know, with the, the rise of the internet and social media, it used to be martial art training was only available to the teachers in your area and right. perhaps bringing in an expert, you know, some recognized person for a seminar or something. Now, everybody, all these people, people are competing for attention with, you know, what I call these look at me clips. And so there gets to be this competition with yeah. look at me clips. The stuff I see that's being put out there, I'm like, dang, you know, like, you know, it, right. it, I mean, you know, I know what, you know, some of my teachers have shown me, but I mean, you know, it, it's, you know, that was in a, you know, a quiet, careful way. And that's, I think, sure. very much the way it used to be with the Filipino arts. But now, right. You know, you know, and there's just a competent look how efficiently I kill. Well, I have a better way. Look, yeah. I, you know, you know, <laughs> like who's out there? You have no idea. You know, there, there's a moral recklessness to that. And, you know, I mm -hmm. get that, you know, for someone who wants to pursue a life in martial arts, the pressures to want attention and, you know, and so sure. forth. And, uh, you know, the competition is now not between you and the other instructors in your area. It's everywhere. But it's you, but you and the whole world. And yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, there uh, was a not to bring this up because it is kind of fresh. I had an issue with uh, a, a group out in Italy who actively promotes this stuff. I mean, they had a thing called a killing machine program. I, uh, I saw your post about this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, it, I have a problem with that. I, I, I show, I, I've made multiple statements that everything that I show is under the framework of, of art, of self-expression. Um, I do show, for example, an empty handed Bob dummy from century martial arts. And I've got a knife, even in that context, I, I'm very careful with how I characterize this. And what's interesting was I was at, uh, you must have gone to the SHOT Show once or twice in your life, right? Uh, and or so twice, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I was surprised at the number of, you know, veterans and, and law enforcement professionals that came up to me and said, hey, I, pre I appreciate what you're doing. And I'm like, hold on a second. And they asked me to, to come train them. And I'm like, hold on, you understand what I'm doing is art, right? This is just building attributes, developing coordination. And they're like, and we understand exactly what it is you're doing. And so there is still this layer of understanding that remains. They're not very social on social media. Um, but even then I, I have, I do think about this moral and ethical line because on on the one hand, it's a it's an it's a knife, you know. A seven year old is dangerous with this thing. Uh, uh, anyone who takes grade ten biology will know where the arteries run along. Um, but even still, even still, people will read. But at the we'll same time, it. there's just the visceral knife porn. Yeah, the yeah. movement is beautiful and it's dark and it has an attractive power to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's one way I sometimes articulate it or try to articulate it is there, there can be a brick and there can be a subtle crack in the brick and it looks strong and it can take compressive pressure and, you know, so forth. But then there's this little tap and all of a sudden the brick cracks just from a little tap. You know, there is some crack, you know, in the emotional maturity and the emotional structure. 
Now, it might be something that would have worked out, you know, over time, you know, with the development of, you know, the other parts of, you know, the, the missing parts of the brain. It might have been something that uh, in a time where fights were settled by fisticuffs, you know, and like, all right, we good. All right, we're good. You know, that, you know, that kind of thing. And you put it right. But if the uh, culture, you know, I'm, I'm very sexist in these things, the culture of manliness. Um, you're going to get canceled. Be careful. <laughs> you know, they'll, you know, you know, they'll get over it. I already have. Um, awesome. Awesome. But, Go on. Um, <laughs> the, the guidance of the older males to the younger males as to how disputes should be settled. And because the younger males intuitively want to be received into the society of full grown men, that they respect the guidance, you know, there'll be some drama about it, but you know, overall the impulse is to respect the guidance of the older males. If the older males are worthy of respect. And ah, that's an important, that's an important part. Yeah. It's and really you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, you know, you know, it's, you know, it's sort of, I guess you could distinguish between men and males, you know, a lot of, there we go. Males of age are not really men anymore. Uh, I think you know, now that way that's because of the 50% decline in testosterone. I mean, you know, we could have, you know, very broad reaching conversation there, sure. but, um, you know, so, uh, if it were, it could be settled with fisticuffs, but if, in the absence of that, and now you get this hot headed, uh, young, young male in adolescent, you know, late teens, early twenties, whatever. And you're saying, yeah. oh, he's at that stage of life in, in the, um, uh, and the, and the, the arc of human development, you know, the young male is very much about acquiring respect, climbing in the hierarchy, mm -hmm. you know, a, you know, a big part of the motivation there is to, you know, get a better mate. You know, the ladies tend to prefer a man of respect. Um, and so he can't lose. And so he, he's never had the, uh, upbringing that communicates to him this is how you within the group how you settle disputes it could be mm -hmm. you know like, you know sports teams over the years you know you know you know grade school and junior high and high school there right. should be a whole development where these lessons are taught but the more and more uh, we find ourselves in a society absent social cohesion mm -hmm. You know, you know, like what? What are the agreed upon standards? Uh, well, maybe they're not really there anymore. America is a distinctive country, and that we're a country born upon a creed. But now we have uh, a very large portion of our ruling class saying that that creed is wrong. You know, it, it's racist. It's blah blah. You know, blah 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 blah. And they tear it down to be replaced by what? And so in the absence of shared understandings, then things, you know, then you have these escalations that get out of hand. And, um, you know, so in that context, you know, so, so you know, like, notice I don't teach knife. You don't see me showing knife techniques on social media. Do you? Not know. really. No, not really. And people are aware that I have the Chupacabra knife system. You know, I do talk about it because I am looking to encourage people to come into the sure. DBNA association. But in that context, I get a chance, you know, I create an environment in which the values in which I think that system needs to operate are part right. of, of the environment. And so, uh, you know, that's how I go about it. But, you know, there are days it's challenging because with all these people putting out stuff for free, it can be tough to compete for free, you right. know, you know, with stuff that's for free. Uh, it's a good trick. And, you know, there's days that's scary, but, you know, just as, uh, you know, like what kind of a man do I want to be, you know, it's whenever my time comes, to, what kind of a man do I want to have been when my time sure. is up? You know? Well, speaking of, of this, this arc of the, development of or development from boy to man i find that yeah, yeah, I, I, I was searching for the word it's ontogeny ontogeny 
Yes. Yeah. There seems there's a, to there's be... a saying, uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Phylogeny being the development over the species over its evolutionary history in a certain sense is re recreated within the ontogeny of the individual. There's a stage at which we crawl. <laughs> there's a, you know, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, any, anyway, you know, like there's a whole... Well, that's you know, the that's, point that I was about to get Anyway, to. I'm sorry to be pulling you off course there. So the ontogeny of the human life the the ontogeny of the human male male yeah let's say that let's say that i find and, and maybe maybe you have the same observation is that there is this hierarchical fight that happens but it happens in this brand new arena of social media so we have these guys proposing their superiority and um force feeding their authority over people that don't want it, didn't ask for well, it. There's a famous quote about Mike Tyson. With so The problem with social media is people don't get punched in the face when they get out of line because they're not in front of each other. You know, right. There's some quote to the gist of that there. And that's something that you know, uh, Conrad Lawrence noted in his writings is that in human-to-human -human conflict, there are very imperfect, but there are limiting factors. When someone is on the ground and they go like this, that, that gesture of total surrender, most humans are, you know, mo most men are going to feel a reluctance to do that some of the time. You know, like I say, very imperfect. But the further away we get from each other as the technology of war evolves, mm -hmm. we, I mean, now we have remote controlled drones. Yeah. It's a video game. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, yeah. it, it, you know so it becomes uh, very easy for elites who fashion and who don't think that they can suffer retaliation to act with quite a bit of hubris. We have some of them in Washington now. You know, what's interesting, I, 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 I hear of drone operators developing PTSD. So there must be some hope that there is a morality deep seated, even despite the separation from the human and the act. Um, that's it's, I just find that interesting, but let's, uh, so, so here we come to, let me toss something else, else out your way. Are you familiar with the terms win, win and zero sum? Um, win, win and zero, and zero like sum. Some game. Uh, yes. So poker would be an example of zero sum. If you start right. the game with $10 and I start the game with $10, whatever happens in the game, there's still only going to be $20, $20. at the end of the okay. game. Right. Someone will have more, someone will have less, but that's right. zero sum. The sum total involved does not change. Win-win would be the basis of uh, market economics. You know, if you and I will only enter into an agreement where each of us feels that that agreement benefits us mm -hmm. and so by the fact of that agreement and its uh execution there's more out there it's what you win i win now one of us might win a bit more or a lot more than the other but neither of us would have entered into the agreement the private contract the private mm -hmm. law enforced by the state in you know a, a properly functioning state um a greater good, a greater sum total of good is created. So uh, years ago, there was a mathematician by the name of John Nash. There was uh, the Russell Crowe movie, A Dangerous Mind or A Beautiful Mind. A Beautiful Mind, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was about him. And one of the things that, as a real person, of course, it was a Hollywood movie, but one of the things he was famous for was something called The Prisoner's Dilemma. And something is very big in what's called game theory. And so he posits a case in which two uh, Confederates are arrested by the police and each is being interrogated separately. And each one is offered the same deal. If you rat out your buddy, you're only going to have a small punishment and your buddy is going to have a huge punishment. And so the question presented to each of them is to like, what is the, what is the best strategy in this game? If you believe that your buddy is not going to rat you out, and I should also say, if neither rats out the other, then they both go free. But if you're afraid that your buddy is going to rat you out, then you better rat him out first. Interesting. And so that, in other words, that would be operating in zero sum. 
the fact that, you know, we both serve time, but me a little and you a lot, I don't want, you know, as versus neither of us serving time. Neither of us serving time would be win-win, but if we both serve time, it, what matters to me is that you're hurt more than me. And so then the, the um, if the game is structured so that it repeats what is the correct strategy, and ultimately the correct strategy is tit for tat. What you did to me the last time, I do to you this time. And so when you have competitors, for example, in geopolitics, you know, or, you know, or between individuals or whatever, the correct strategy is what you did to me last time. So the great trick can be is when two people are both locked into a zero sum mentality is to recognize an opportunity. You know, if you, if you play win, win, the other guy will screw you. And that's Darwinianly speaking, a losing strategy. And so I think, you know, this is, I analyze a lot of human behavior through that. So help me bring me back. I've drifted far afield here. What were, what was the previous point that took me on this tangent? I'm, I'm writing right along with you. I'm on the tangent. <laughs> I totally forgot. Yeah, but I, it sort of feels like time to bring it back. Um, okay. And the well, reason I brought this up is, um, what were we saying? Maybe, maybe the viewers can help up. I, I think I think this is a good way to to ask about objective morality. Can is there such thing? Oh, here's Sonny Pazikas. My goodness, honored to oh, have you with us, Sonny. Yeah, he's he's but uh, he's he's uh, he's asked a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, and one I, of them is, yeah. Okay, Sonny, great great question. Uh, obviously, defining objective morality, right? Um, you know, is a, is a question in its own right, but I, you know, you're you're echoing you know what I've been trying to articulate here, which is that I don't teach killing knife you know openly. You know that for me it must be anchored. Uh, so as someone who believes strongly in uh, what I call the American creed, I look at the American Declaration of Independence, which um, one of the things you find in there is a very beautiful phrase. Our rights, you know, are, are come from the laws of nature and of nature's God. There are certain things which are just that is the nature of things. It is the nature of things that you have a right to eat, survive, and reproduce. So if you have the right to eat, you have a right to make your way. You do not need permission of the government to earn your keep. So the right to survive, the right of self-defense, of which the Second Amendment is but an expression. The right to self-defense, although not articulated as such in those specific words, can be found in the Ninth Amendment, which is rights not otherwise enumerated remain retained by the people. There is a right to self-defense. There is a right to privacy. This is the nature of things in the theoretical construction of natural law, which is the foundation of the American creed and which is the foundation of the American Constitution. So when I teach my knife system, which begins with knife versus empty hand, I say, why on earth would we, be, I, the, the, before I go into the specifics of how to do that, I say, under what circumstances would we use a knife against an unarmed man? Most people, because they are in the young male ritual hierarchical mindset, have a hard time answering that. And so the first thing I say is, I'm 70 years old. And so my starting point is what I call malevolent Mongo, just a big, angry, dangerous person. He's younger, bigger, stronger, meaner, crazier than me. And, you know, people have been around me a while, know my story of coming home to my house one day. And there's this uh, large, muscular Samoan guy, I'm going to say he's about 280 pounds and he's covered with prison tattoos and he's in the electric phone box in my house. Hmm. Long story short, he was a bill collector. You know, he was out of prison and he was working as a, as a bill collector and he thought that the, per, the debtor might be me. And, you know, I was able to clarify that I wasn't the debtor and, you know, that was the end of it. But I went, went on to, I use him as a mental exercise. If I had to come forward against somebody like this for whatever reason, because he thought I was the debtor because as Confederates were grabbing my family, you know, whatever the reason, and all I had was my little everyday carry knife, I would be terrified to have to come forward towards him because I might, you know, the stopping power of an everyday carry size knife is not immediate. And somebody coming out of prison, mm -hmm. such as this person was, is not going to be afraid of my little three inch blade. Mm -hmm. And, you know, stopping him from blood loss is going to take a long time. And he certainly, the probability is he's going to knock me out first and stop me 
stop my skull flat for having pulled the knife on him. So the starting point of the system, and it is a moral point, is that if I have such a danger in front of me, this is how I use a knife to defend myself, to assert a bubble. If I have to get past him, he's blocking my exit. This is how I have, you know, this is how I go at him frontally. That is the beginning of the moral foundation. How do I establish a bubble and how do I go at somebody who challenges my bubble? So that is the starting point. I try to establish it in a moral and objective way. I try to establish it in terms of uh, what are the rules of engagement so far as is possible. Be on good terms with all men. What you think of me is none of my business. Genetically, we are programmed to respond to disrespect, but something relatively new in our evolutionary history is that we are in environments where the other people are anonymous to us. We've never mm -hmm. seen them before. We will never see them oh, again. Boy. So their disrespect does not matter. But to engage with that disrespect, oh, you insulted me. I must defend my honor. We get in evolutionary, Darwinianly stupid engagements. What you think of me is none of He's my business. Avoid the three S's, stupid people in stupid places doing stupid <laughs> things. Is this hey. worth having to go to jail? Is this worth having to hire a lawyer, go broke, is, you know, and so forth? You know, all these How's things. your record with that? Are you able to apply that philosophy? I mean, with that point so, so, you know, those are the rules of engagement. If somebody crosses those lines, that is when, because I'm not fighting over hierarchy, I'm fighting over self-defense. And that is the first rule of natural law eat, survive, and reproduce. I would also point out that reproduce is the origin of parental rights vis the state. And that's a whole, geo, you know, that's a whole sociopolitical <laughs> conversation yeah, there. Yeah. But, you know, the right to self-defense is, you know, the Second Amendment is but one expression of it. And there are times when a knife is a better solution than a gun because you don't know what's behind your problem. You know, May I ask a question? Of, sure. Here's a related question, and I'm going to reel us back a little bit back into morality and why you don't show um, knife work online. Um, and going back to Sonny's question here, talking about objective morality, um, do you then object to firearms instructors, which I know Sonny is one, of showing marks? Uh, we're not we're not talking tactics. Well, that's a very good question. I I know the question, and it's a very good question. And um, I mean, here I am, you know, training alongside you know Frankie McRae, and you know Frankie McRae is an intensely moral person. You mm -hmm. know, he, he says my mission in life is to help good people fight evil. Um, but there, I think. There is something distinctive about a knife. And, you know, the, 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 you know, I don't, it's a good question. I don't know that, you know, often I have a pretty well worked out articulate and you know, semi articulate answer. I'm, you know, I'm not sure that I do in this case, but, you know, I, I certainly know that in my firearms training with Frankie, you know, the, you know you know, he teaches the uh, one day course to get the North Carolina CCW. And so that we need to know, well, OK, what's our legal environment? And then he's right. got um, level one, two, three, four for advanced concealed carry. And it's uh, there's a lot of exercises that make you appreciate. Oh, whoops, I could have shot through a wall and killed somebody. Oh, whoops. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, you know, there's these little scenarios. OK, it's in the store. Now there's idiots running around and screaming and you have the gun out and another would be hero thinks you're the bad guy and he shoots you. And, you know, just all the ways in which things go wrong and to be very, very humble about mm -hmm. pulling a gun. Be very, very humble about pulling a gun, using a gun and so forth. Um it's a tough so, question because even marksmanship, basic marksmanship, that is information, you know, that is publicly shared openly multiple times, glorified online. And yet we draw and I, I, I kind of understand the difficulty in, in articulating how we differentiate a knife versus a gun when, you know, in the eyes of the law, they're they're both. Deadly force, but right. you know, in terms of you know, mo most gun instruction, um, it's like okay, you know, here's the grip. You know, you, you have flip, you have rise. Uh, you know, like okay, the thumbs point this way. Here's how you know carpal tunnel alignment. 
you know, this so that you can better isolate the trigger finger, you know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and so there's, you know, like, you know, okay, reload the shotgun, put it here like this, pull it here like this. You can come over the top. You can come under the bottom. If you have a magazine, you're like, okay, you know, you know, da, 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 da. And it's all very technical. It's not emotional. But then, you know, but the emotional part, you know, then the playing games we play with a knife, we're sticking that, you know, we're pretending to stick the knife in somebody. Think well, of that case. I told you about the guy who killed that bouncer, you know, without yeah. their, you know, because it was like, okay, this big guy is hands on my friend and I'm like, oh, the sea cut. Boom. And, you know, you know. Well, I can teach the knife the way these guys teach a gun. We're talking about grip. We're talking about technical and, and muscle control and alignment. When we go to the range, there's a reason that those targets are shaped like humans. Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah, so you get into the David Grossman stuff and so <laughs> forth. Yeah. yeah. Um, I acknowledge the point and I, I fully agree. I don't have a... Yeah. a Really articulated I, I, answer, but I do I think know. there is a difference. I, 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 I would point out that the gun people that I'm around are very careful to ground the sure. firearm training and not, in, you know, some sure. Yahoo uh, yeah. fantasy. And there's know, typically you know, like a Hollywood, movie, movie. Hollywood movies are some of the worst stuff. These, you know, these Hollywood <laughs> yeah. progressives. You know, the movies that they put out there, the message of those movies is like ba bang, yeah. ba bang, and then you know just. And, you know, right. just the, 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 the shooter just walked off. Like, yeah. no, you know, you're now looking at. I know. You just killed the you know, you know, or whatever. Hey, let me ask you, let's transition real quick, okay? Um, let me ask you some fast questions. Um, well, here, let me just say, Sonny, did I answer your question? We'll hear from you. Uh, you you've been interesting places and done interesting things. Right. So, you know, if you want to jump in with a follow up question, Sonny, be glad to hear from you. So, anyway, here, keep you got going. some more comments uh, before we get to the fast questions. Oh, here we are. Here we are. Uh, first of all, yes, sir. Hold on. I want to see a question. Oh, um, you, you got it. You hold got on. It. And we have, but then, without strong president, the potential soon you've written simply. Can we be making faith or answer? My answer would be no. Um, and, you know, this is where that foundation, uh, I think this is something the Dog Brothers experience has a lot to offer, that by virtue of engaging and what happens when you receive the mercy of someone who is your better and the, the humbleness of that and the want, the respect of people who act in that manner, that person begins to evolve into somebody who perhaps grows into being worthy of that training. Here's his next comment. All right, here, hold on. Knife is special. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> There's a saying that there are only two ways to be inside another person. Yeah, I, I can read it. It's, uh, yeah, I, uh, Sonny, I agree 100%. All right. You ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be a complete 180 from the... the okay the deep stuff we've been talking about all right and this is just so that we get to know a little bit about you as a human being maybe outside of fighting okay what's a hobby that you enjoy unrelated to fighting that people might be surprised to know uh i like playing piano and and, and uh guitar what I, was a failed, I was a failed musician were you yeah i was the um uh... I was the only white guy in a nine-man band in North Philadelphia. We had uh, three percussion. I was uh, piano and rhythm guitar. We did Funkadelics, uh, Santana, Jimi Hendrix, and original tunes. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I just the talent level wasn't quite there. But, um, you know, I, I still enjoy playing for myself. Well, there you go. You, you, haven't, you haven't failed. Um, what do you eat for breakfast? Uh, my wife makes me these, uh, breakfast burritos. They're available for me when I get up. So it'll be, uh, eggs and, uh, you know, I like having sweet potato. It's a burrito. So it'll be eggs and, uh, I, I put, you know, yams or brown rice or sometimes potatoes. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that, you know that, that's my breakfast. What musical artist might people be surprised to know you listen to? 
Uh, well, it, you know, people on my Facebook yeah. page know I'm a huge fan of the Jefferson Airplane. I listen to them still. I saw them 23 times. So I was very much uh, in the psychedelic hippie era of music. Uh, my first concert my father took me when I was 12 years old. I saw the Beatles. I saw the Jefferson what? Airplane 23 times. I saw Jimi Hendrix twice, including the Band of Gypsies concert. I saw Grand uh, at the Height of Its Powers. I saw Led Zeppelin on its first tour in the subsequent time. I saw a lot. Of, I was uh, at Woodstock. I left after the first night. It was too muddy and rainy, and everybody was too full of themselves. But I was at Woodstock. Uh, you know, I could go through a whole list of music, but also, as a kid, I would... Uh, sneak out of the house and take the, the Lexington Avenue subway down to the village and sneak into this jazz club called uh, Slugs. And that was in the Far East Village. And um, I would see McCoy Tyner. McCoy Tyner was awesome. And, you know, other people, you know, uh, you know that. And so, and, uh, and I'm a huge fan of salsa music. But, you know, salsa music was in the air everywhere in New York. You dance? Uh, you know, it's, um, you know, you dance it's, it's, it's even free salsa, I, I guess it'd be more precise to call it boogaloo. You know, so I really like the boogaloo music. You know, you know, you know Pandora, you know, I, you know, there's the boogaloo assassins and uh, uh, Sonora Carasuelas. Uh, yeah, great boogaloo bands. And, uh, you, you can't so, like yeah. salsa music without dancing to salsa music, right? Is that, would you agree with that? No, you know, you know, when no one's watching, I think. <laughs> <laughs> footage. Um, okay, cool. Um, hey, what time do you usually sleep at night? Ah, well, with all my years of uh, going back and forth between California and Europe, and also gen certain genetic predispositions, my grandfather, my mother, and so forth, uh, I have a lot of sleep disorder. Um, you know, when it's, you know, going from California to you know, Switzerland or elsewhere in Europe, it's like a nine hour time zone difference. In, yeah. You know, you know, you know, so. Uh, so I have this tendency to sleep either three or four and, you know, I'll like, sleep three hours and I'll wake up for an hour or two and uh, then I'll get back to sleep. And, you know, so the sleep is a tricky thing for me. Uh, I know my wife got me this Fitbit for, uh, for Christmas and it's it got a really, uh, wonderful ability to read to sleep okay you, you went to sleep at this time you went down to light sleep you came up to rem uh, right. for a certain amount of time then you went down oh. into deep sleep for a certain amount you know so it, it graphs it out every night and so that's helping me um you know, improve that, in that regard that would um, give me anxiety to have my sleep data I'd be well, comparing it's, it's, you know, I, I actually went and uh, you know had this sleep study and they put all these wires and tubes on me, so of course I couldn't sleep. And you know now here this Fitbit's giving me information they were looking to glean. Uh, okay. So yeah, apparently I have mild sleep apnea, uh, but you know it's like so okay so um, oh so now when I have that uh, what's the word um, my son brought to my attention uh, by it shows in you know the old writings like from the mid middle ages or before they spoke about the first sleep and the second sleep and that people would naturally wake up during the night and sort of be quietly awake for a while before going back to sleep so it's actually what you're doing that's very natural hmm. and you know so there might be that but one of the things uh that it also does is it the what as it tracks in a fairly good way my oxygen level and so it's like, I said, well, I said, oh, the oxygen level got depleted here like this. I realized, oh, this, this uh, nostril is, is, is blocked. And so oh I, you know, I blow my nose and then, you know, and clear it out. And, you know, so I work on having better oxygen flow and that helps me get back to sleep or, you know, I'll pay attention on to the, uh, the depth of my breathing patterns and so forth. You know, I, I naturally have a pretty low uh, pulse rate. When I'm well rested, it's 52. When I'm not so well rested, it drifts up to around 56. But um, you know, uh, you know, say you know, sort of paying attention to these variables. Uh, you know, I'm working on improving it. But you know, so typically I go to sleep, I guess, around 11:30 or 12. But sometimes it's more, and you know, sometimes I wake up. And, you know, it, okay. It, but I don't know. You know, who, who? You know, basically too much, too much TMI, too much information. <laughs> All right. Speaking of which, what what is what is your guilty pleasure? Uh, I don't know. Uh, 
despite being Jewish, I try not to you know, be very influenced by guilt. Uh, <laughs> Do you watch like uh, the Kardashians or? Oh God, no. Maybe <laughs> I didn't think so. I thought I'd ask. I don't know. Maybe you're a secret, like you know, uh, Kim Kardashian fan. Uh, any foods you shouldn't be eating that you enjoy? Do you gamble? Like, do you drink? What What's your guilty pleasure? You can't think of any. It's just. Uh, <laughs> off the top of my head, not really. Oh, all right, I'm just gonna assume it's the Kardashians then. Um, <laughs> Where, where is your happy place? Ah. Well, you know, good martial art training in the zone, in the flow is, you know, it's a wonderful place to be. And, um, you know, coming to a new understanding, I re recently came to a new understanding through my uh, obesitario material, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, really? uh, back in my notebook uh, that Gurnasano gave me when he promoted me to girl. And I look, it's like, you know, there's this thing I've actually, I just saw that for the first time in decades. Uh, but there's a, I forget the filter on your name for it, but, you know, it's basically the study of pathways. And so that is interesting. Abecedario, ABCs, right? Like the foundational, could be considered the foundational building blocks. Yeah, you, that's why I call it the abecedarios. Um, you rediscovered so that, something new? And, and, and so that is very, you know, so I, came to some new insights about that recently. And it's like, oh, I can't believe it took me all these decades to figure this out. But That's it did. Amazing. Um, That's inspiring. But, um, and it fits in very nicely with, uh, you know, a Boyd's, uh, John Boyd's change in height, speed and direction. So like, you know, so for example, uh, how do you punch in combination without retracting? What the hell kind of question is that? That's awesome. Wait, I don't know. How do I want, you I mean, that, that, I'll leave that to you as a Zen cone, but I'm not going Ooh. to answer it here and now. Hmm. Oh, I think I might have an answer though. Well, keep it to yourself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what's something that you will never do again? <sighs> Hmm. If I were, you know, I, I could probably think about it and the answer would probably not be one that I'd be interested in sharing in this context. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Oh, by the way, in when you were uh, um, in your hippie days, did you ever do psychedelics? Do you still yeah. do them now? No comment. Okay, well. But um, yeah, you know, I, you know, I'm psilocybin. You know, That's... I didn't like the act. I didn't like the acid so much. Uh, you know, I yeah. definitely preferred the mescaline and the psilocybin. Psilocybin. And, um, yeah. Are you familiar with the Don Juan books? No, sir. Carlos Castaneda, series of books. The first four are very good. After that, they got kind of incoherent. And a story of a uh, guy going for a sociology piece, uh, uh, PhD from UCLA. And as a Mexican-American, he spoke Spanish and he decided he wanted to learn about the Indians of Northwest Mexico and their use of hallucinogens. And so he sets off and he meets this guy, Juan Matus, and uh, he's kind of condescending to him as this kind of Stone Age Indian from, you know, out in the desert of Northwest Mexico and this and that. And over time, he realizes that this man is way ahead of him as a man. And it's part of getting, and so Don Juan looks at him and he thinks, and it's a beautiful piece of writing. Because Juan looks at, this guy's an idiot, but the powers that he believed in, he believed these powers were telling him, despite this guy, Carlos, being an idiot, as he was to work with him. And so part of working with him is he started giving him the psychedelics, you know, giving him psychedelics in order to change how he saw the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, the books proceed and there comes a point at which Carlos meets another one of Don Juan's apprentices. And they got, he, the first evening we realized Don Juan had other apprentices and there's this guy and in conversation with this other apprentice, he, the other guy says like, uh, you know, how many times did you do, you know, these things, these hallucinogens? He says, oh, once. And 
Carlos goes to Don Juan. He says, well, why did you give them to me so many times? Don Juan says, because you're stupid. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shit. And so what is revealed there is, you know, like, uh, you know, one of the ditties that I use as a teacher is intelligence is the amount of time it takes to forget a lesson. If you go to the end of um, the fir- third tape in the first series where the, the man ape is throwing the bone up in the air, and then I let a lot of time go by. So if you're kind of sitting there and the credits are just rolling, then a very leisurely fashion spread out, there's a series of questions. What is the secret to life? The secret to life is to get smart faster than you get old. Well, then, what is the definition of intelligence? Intelligence is the amount of time it takes to forget a lesson. Are intelligence and wisdom the same thing? No, wisdom is choosing the right lessons. But so we can learn quickly, but if we forget quickly, life will give us the lesson again. So the point that Don Juan was making in his answer to Carlos was, this guy only needed one time to change the way he saw the world, but because you kept forgetting the lesson of these experiences, I have to give them to you many times. And Are these so, psychedelic experiences real? And, and, and. Wait, I, I, so, I, I, I don't want to give me a moment. And so. Sorry. Once you learn the lessons of the psychedelics, you don't need to keep doing them. And so, for example, you know, so if you look at the way I talk uh, about the dog brothers and the altered space that comes from a dog brothers gathering. And so some of the, you know, I'm talking to people about this, you know, people have done it. And I say, you're like, hold on to that space. And that's where I'll start talking about intelligence, the amount of time it takes to forget a lesson. If the idea is to carry that altered space with you, never let it go. And that, that's part of how the dog brother experience changes how you, um, yeah. what kind of a man you are or woman. But, you know, change, you know it changes who you are. It higher does. consciousness through harder contact it does change who you are uh it's difficult to hold on to it though i have found i've been yeah. there because this world is so compelling and it, it slowly yeah. drags you back into it um uh, but thank you for sharing what, what you shared about uh psychedelics maybe we'll talk more about that off air um which country do you enjoy being hosted by the most as far as seminars? I like them all each in their own way. <laughs> oh, that's such a, come on. How about a real yeah, answer? No, no, yeah, it, it's, um, <laughs> I have deep love for Mexico. I've been going down there since uh, 1973. Uh, <laughs> my Spanish is, you know, more than anything, a Mexican Spanish. Of course, there was some thread on Facebook today. It's like, do the different countries, the Spanish, do they understand each other? Yes, they do. Um, but, um, you know, when I'm talking to a Spanish speaker from some other country, they will recognize that my Spanish is of Spanish origin, of Mexican origin. So, I, you know, I like that there. Um, some real life changing experiences for me in Mexico over the years. But, um, yeah, gosh, I love, you know, Benji bringing me to Switzerland, but that's, that's Benji, you know, you know, Lonely Dog, you know, Switzerland, you know, um, yeah, I've been, I've been to a lot of countries and, uh, you know, so I, I, I really don't want to go down to, you know, which one is best. I mean, just each one in its own way. And that, 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 that's sincerely said. All right, Mark, um, we're at an hour and 30. I have just a few more questions. If you've got a, a few more moments, you're okay with this? I do. And then I'm going to head out to the gym. Today's my day to do the football sled and, and uh, uh, trap bar deadlifts. All right. So I'm going to ask for some guidance. These questions have everything to do with, you know, my journey, and but I'm sure it, it reflects other people's journeys as well. So can you give us a checklist? First question. Can you give us a checklist of things we need to do or things we need to be before we begin teaching the martial arts, Filipino martial arts? (sighs) 
was, I think the second or the third time that I went to U.S. Border Patrol Tactical at Harpers Ferry, uh, West Virginia. I'm uh, intermediate force subject matter expert for, for Border Patrol, and I, as I, I brought Anton along with me, Anton Haley, who's now a uh, girl splinter dog. Uh, he's also uh, San Francisco PD, and he's also now the two-time uh, National Tactical Games uh, champion. And, you know, we walked in and so, you know, the, the, the trainers at the advanced center, uh, you know, when I first started going there, yeah, not impressive. You know, you know, like there was some real affirmative action hires and, you know, and so forth. But, you know, by the, you know, the third time there, it's like, damn, these are some serious dudes here. You know, uh, you know, what people have no understanding, you know, appreciation of what it takes to go out as part of a two or four man team into no man's land along the Mexican border. I mean, you know, no, you know, help is far away. You are on your own, and the the range and complexity of problems that you you will be called upon to solve is extraordinary. And Anton says to me, he says, "Wow, these guys are you know, they're all mega alphas." Uh, you know, like, you know, you know, like he was much earlier in his process. Now, he, now he's been a defensive tactics instructor for San Francisco PD because of all his street experience, and he's one of the. I, you know, I would say, you know, in terms of physical skill, I would put them in, you know, let's say maybe the top three of people that, you know, who pass through my hands. I mean, you know, so, you know, very much, you know, but at that point, psychologically, he was a much younger man. And I just said to him, it's really easy. Don't bullshit. You know, don't pretend to, you know, if you're teaching just like, this is how, you know, what makes sense to me. This is, you know, this is this, this is that. But just don't bullshit. Don't try to be more than you're not. Right. You know, what like, that, yeah. knowing yourself, authenticity, sincerity, honesty, checklist. Well, life. you know, for me, so for me, that came out of, um, you know, my experience as dog brothers it, it, you know, and, and so forth. And, you know, like Gurren Asano would, I would never be the guy that Gurren Asano would call on to demonstrate the art. Why is that? You know, but on the other hand, I spent a lot of years at his, you know, at his knee, uh, you know, at his feet. Um, and so I've got a tremendous vocabulary uh, to, you know, to call upon and, and offering a menu to the people who train with me. And Gurren Asano says this, is, you know, some people, you know, they teach what they do. This is what I do. I'm really good at it. Imitate me. And then some people's, it's like you go to the restaurant. You know, some people like one dish, some people on the menu, some people like another dish. You know, the chef should not be saying, well, this is my favorite dish and not offer other dishes. People have differences. And so um, I think I have a good ability. I have, think I have a good eye for what's going on in the fight. And I have thanks to my training with Grona Sano and my other teachers that I can problem solve. Say, okay, you know, what did I say earlier? What is the problem to be solved? So, um, you know, it can be very specific to um, real contact stick fighting. Um, so, you know, so for example, there was this one guy, very big, very strong, and he fought in, in a double stick, uh, Kali Illustris. I need to stand up for this. Here we go. And so he fought here like this. And so, he, you know, you know, big power caveman, fluid attack, boom, maybe a frondo, sometimes into a thrust. And that was his structure. He's like 6'3", 235, you know, done with power and intention. And one of my students who was going to fight him, and he says, what are you doing having me, you know, go against this guy? Because this student of mine was uh, much less experienced. I said, well, it's really simple. You're going to fight him instead of double stick, single stick. He says, why is that important? He says, because his caveman swing finishes in elbow fulcrum. So when he comes back, his forearm's going to be open. So I will give you a checklist of things to do against that. Double stick, he could do that because this stick was there to protect and cover. But you take away this stick now as he's coming back, you will be, you know, you will draw the roof block. Here's the things you do against when you, you know you can force somebody to throwing a roof block, yada yada yada. And my student kicked his ass. So I helped him solve the structures. You know, something that uh you know, yeah, I I forget somebody quoted me on this recently, but you know, you don't beat the man, you beat his style. Yeah. Sugar Ray Leonard, as he was going into his fight with Marvin Hagler, 
He I sat like ringside that. as Hagler uh, fought John the Beast Mugabe, who was a fearsome, scary guy, 26 and 0 with 26 knockouts. Mm-hmm. You know, guy falling over for one punch, like, you know, falling over like a tree. And Hagler ringside, and who had been fighting at Welter, 147, and Hagler was in Mugabe were middleweights, 160. And he says, I challenge, and I don't need a warm up fight. And he had yeah. been retired. And everyone said, what are you doing? He said, you know, you don't understand. You beat the man, you beat his style. No, I love that very much. I think um, I think it's a hallmark of also good parenting these days to manufacture adversity for our children so that they can develop character and learn on their own. Um, I, I really well, like to manufacture adversity, but simply to allow it. Oh, that's what that's another thing. Right. For sure. I mean, that's along the same lines, you know, um, um, but manufacturing adversity may be enrolling your kid in jujitsu or wrestling. Right. It's uh, mm-hmm. to allow them to take those things. So I, I, I love that teaching style. That's something that I've that's very close to to me and what I intend to do shortly. Um, so here's a here's a specific question that you may approach generally. Um, can a guy who starts FMA at the age of 55 with no prior martial arts background ever become a dog brother? Yeah. Now, you know, it's, it, it, it's, you know, athletically, where is he at? You know, well, did he, he play, you know, like, you know, so for example, before Eric started Filipino martial, I started at 30, which is a late start for martial arts. My first martial arts 20, training was 20, at 30. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, Eric, you know, what did he bring? He played lacrosse, which is tricky movements with a stick with a basket on the end. And he was a defensive end for Columbia University football. Okay. Uh, you know, so he he was familiar with running at small. You know, man with ball, Mongo go smash. You know, <laughs> so you know there was an athletic background. You just you know so you know now if this guy has been a desk jockey for the last you know thirty five years and is completely unfit, um, maybe no not. Hmm? No chance yeah, if he. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there, there, there is a certain, um, you know, we have a wide range of ages and a wide range of athleticism, but there needs to be something, uh, you know, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, it, you, know, uh, you know, there needs to be some sort of genuine test. And one of the things about uh, initiation rituals is that they, there, need, there needs to be the risk of failure. There needs to be danger. And, you know, if you make it, you know, other, without that, then it's hard to have a genuine initiation ritual. So for somebody, you know, but the thing is, don't go to a dog brother gathering in order to become a dog brother. Because, you know, if that's the purpose, you're actually violating part of the magic yeah. world. Magic words. No judges, no trophies, no... No judges, no uh, trophies, no referees, no judges. You do not, the meaning of the experience, you determine. No judges, no trophies. You do not do this for the uh, admiration of others. No referees. You remain responsible for your own behavior. So if someone says, I want to be a dog brother, and it is a cool thing to be a dog brother. El Pinche had a meme this morning about this is your girlfriend when she hears that I'm a dog brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but, you know, but part of the thing is because of, you know, who we are and the values and how we go about it <clears throat> and what it, you know, it takes the respect of the tribe to be accepted into the tribe. Um that's that's you know, there's great meaning dog there's dog great dog. meaning in becoming a dog brother but if you go into the experience in order to become a dog brother so that you have this brag then that's not very dog brotherly that's amazing advice that's that's really great advice yeah quick divergence here i think one of the contrib- well, going back to the very first question one of the first questions i asked is you know that you um, evaded was you know what are what are what do you suppose is the greatest contribution of the dog brothers to the filipino martial arts first thing i think it is a it has become a trophy to fight a dog brother in in circles and other filipino martial arts there is a there there is a when when you become a dog brother i feel like there is a 
target on your back and people want to fight you so that they can say they hit you. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is actually an amazing contribution that in some ways the dog brothers have a target on their back and they're saying, catch me if you can. And I think that's a great thing for the broader Filipino martial arts community. I'm not saying everybody thinks this way or everyone feels like this, but certainly you must know that it is somewhat of a, um, a trophy to fight a dog. I know that's out there, but let me, what, what I find popping into mind as you ask me that question is the way that we have always controlled video to the dog brother gatherings. Because, yeah. Um, oh, okay. Because if it becomes a, I hit a dog brother, here's me kicking a dog brother's ass, that changes the nature of how people can act at a gathering. Right. Because one of the things that is necessary to the fight is that you don't take the shot that's too much. So if I'm fighting some guy who's probably got better grappling skills than me and he comes in like many grapplers do head first, I could take him out with a puño to the back. Puño, uh, uh, too much. You know, risk of brain damage, too much. But if I don't want to take the risk of, you know, being embarrassed, my dog brother name being embarrassed or, you know, you know, something like that, you know, uh, right. Um, so, you know, I've always, you know, I, some of the guys were unhappy with me, you know, with my insistence on this policy, but by keeping control of the video, everybody who comes knows that their, you know, their fights will not be abused to, yeah. you know, to their embarrassment or to the embarrassment of their teacher sure. or their style. Sure. And, you yeah. know, so we, we had a, we had a, uh, a group back in the mid nineties, um, and, uh, you know, this was back in the early days of uh, the UFC. And so they, their group was, oh, well, we have an answer to the, you know, the jujitsu, we have our knives. And, you know, well, night, you know, jujitsu is an MMA fight. MMA is a hierarchical fight. MMA is a hierarchical fight. Knife is not a hierarchical fight. You know, you know so you're mixing idioms of aggression there. And, uh, you know, some of these guys had teardrop tattoos and so forth. And, um, they had uh, they had a guy, very nice guy. He's a football player. You know, so he wasn't really a representative of their style so much. It's just simply a great, big, strong athlete. And uh, he, you know, first gathering he came to, he kicked some guy's ass. It wasn't a dog brother, but they had a hidden video camera underneath a blanket or something. And then there on the internet was, you know, our style beating a dog brother. And, you know, so I had, uh, you know, conversation with them about that. So the, the develop, there's a lot of sideline stories that a lot of people don't know over the years of, you know, you know, my role as the guiding force of the Dog Brothers sort of quietly talking to somebody so that the culture of the, of, of the, of the tribe and the culture of the event grew in a certain way and, and, and fed upon itself. And, uh, you know, but if... You know, it, it's inevitable that, uh, you know, some people are going to go about that. Like, you know, like I hit a dog brother, I beat a dog yeah. brother. Yeah. And I think you're right. That's that's part of the nature of you controlling what actually happens at those events. And that that's a well, I, I just I, I just control the video. What happens, happens. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that too is part of it is, you know, like yeah. a time, place and sort. You're showing up and whatever happens, happens. You know. Let uh, me ask you this. Has there a... a can a dog brother's fight happen where it is beautiful and sophisticated and in some respects calm? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 On the other hand, you want to be able to still handle it that way when the other guy isn't. I, I see there is, I, this is why I love your organization. This uh, as just even from an outsider's perspective, being friends with a few, a few dogs is that, uh, you know, one of the questions I, I had here is what's a common misconception about the Dog Brothers gatherings? You know, and I think I think that might be one of them is that every fight is hardcore and, you know, to the death. Uh, I've seen beautiful 
like absolutely beautiful matches where I just I watch three seconds of it over and over again because I see elaboration and sophistication of technique. And oftentimes I think it's a common for the haters. They they cite these videos where look at him. He's just charging in and he got hit in the head and he didn't respect it. And I think people don't understand that there is beauty and sophistication and like technical precision amongst the violence and the aggression. And it's, it's part of why I love the, the culture, but it's not often spoken of, is it? Mm, yeah. I, I think some of us speak of it. Um, it's, um, you know, I, I, you, you may have seen some of these little uh, mini essays I write that I call rambling ruminations. I, I watched the audiobook because <laughs> you, you, you. Okay. You All right. Well, one of these little rambling ruminations uh, that I wrote called um, Let Your Fight Be Play. And so it starts with a passage from Conrad Lorenz. And, um, right. you know, he would study the behaviors of animals. And so he says, if you observe the behaviors of a cat when it gets the zoomies, it goes through these behaviors that are unrelated to each other, they would never be. In, in series in nature, leaping for a bird, turning sideways to, you know, arch its back to scare a predator or, you know, yeah. you, know you know, just all these different behaviors strung together in a way that would make no sense in, in nature. And he says, you know, this is play. And in this play, this is where the cat experiences what the options are. And in fighting, the more fluidly you transition from structure to structure, that is a state of play. That, that mental speed is the greatest speed of all is the transitioning between idioms of movement, between yeah. idioms of logic. And so the more that you can stay in the state of play, the better a fighter you are. Yes, sir. And therefore, you know, the, and through the dog brother experience that we don't impart or take on necessary damage, over time we acquire not only pretty well tested in the adrenal state skill sets, but also a pretty calm mind. And when you have a calm mind, then the quality of your thinking and your spontaneity and your skills also goes up. Mm. And so, so people say to me, don't you ever worry about somebody of bad intention coming to a gathering? Well, not so much. One reason is because we don't take cheap shots, but the person of bad intention, he does believe in cheap shots and he knows just how good we are. And we're really good. And so that means he would be submitting himself in front of the, this world whose respect he seeks, that if he were to try the cheap shot, he would yeah. pay the price and lose the respect. And so they, they, his solution is to not show up. Yep. No, I, I get it, man. And uh, <laughs> I, I know exactly what you're talking about. That next fight is going to be a different experience for a guy who comes in with bad intentions. There's no shortage of enforcers um in that circle it's like the wild west in that there is order there's an unspeaking unspoken code i love that about it i love that about it um man do you ever just step outside of yourself and go damn this is friggin awesome what we built this is this is what awesome. awesome. you, you know like you know <laughs> like, like, that song, what a long straight trip it's been I mean, you know, how a, you know. Wait, say uh, that again, say that again. The Grateful Dead song. Yeah. What a long, strange trip it has been. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, it's, um, <laughs> you, know, you, know, well, you know, one thing to say is where we are is a result of what we have done with where, where we have been. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, referencing back to the psychedelics, one of the things, you know, people around me know I like to say the adventure continues. You know, so if you, you know, you know, there's passages of the Don Juan books about that, about following pa only paths that have heart and just following them with wonder. And um, it's, I mean, here, you know, for me, the long strange trip, I started out as a pencil neck, heavy Jew boy bookworm. You know? <laughs> And yeah, yeah, you know, somehow, you know, here I am. You know, the world, you know, the world. Well, you're is still a, some of those things. Those yeah, are still absolutely, in you. Absolutely. Right? And I am, you know, these other things as well. 
however we want to label them. Yeah. Huh. That a good break point? That's a great break point. I think that's, uh, this has been a, a great conversation for me. It flew by. We're almost at two hours. Yeah, no. And, you know, I, I would have been surprised had it been otherwise. You know, I've been watching you and, you know, you are a, uh, a playful person. You know, you know, you know, you, start, you know. And, uh, <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. And oh, gonna... oh, it is. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look for, um, you know, you, you know, I could say a shit stirrer. But uh, I'm that too. Sometimes. Yeah, but I mean, but you know, you know, I didn't choose that one because that could be taken negatively. You know, just some. You know, it's like okay. You know, let's. Uh, what are the things that you know we're afraid to ask? What are the things that we are uh, afraid to talk about? Well, that clearly that's where we need to go. And, you know, in a certain sense, that's where the Dog Brothers began. Like, okay, you know, with all this, you know, you know Eric called it the tippy-tappy stuff. You, you, know, um, you know, like, like what happens? What really happens? And at the same time, we're not, you know, we're, you know, we're of life, not death. We're not about death matches. And so, you know, you know, you know, we've all, you know, from, you know, the fencing mass and the light, light, the light street hockey gloves and, uh, and with the code that we have. So it's, it's dangerous, but not destructive. And, you know, out of that danger comes the experience that is transformative. Albert Jundis is uh, here. Ah, uh, hmm. Interesting qu question. I thought we were winding up, but El El Elric is uh, asking the question. Guy, I thought we were too. This guy wants to talk about flow states. Let's do it. Let's. Do it. Let, okay. All right, here. Put that back up on the screen for me. Yes, Can you do that? Um, Elric and his flow state question. Ah, uh, okay. Um, well, the trick is to be in the flow state while in the adrenal state. Right. Yeah, I think we covered that a little bit. Yeah. Um, that's so, rough. That's you know, rough. so there's my answer. The idea is to develop the flow state in the adrenal state. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Listen, I would love to talk to you again. Thank you so much for sharing all that you have. Thank you for your contributions to the Filipino martial arts. It's uh, it's been a pleasure for me. Oh, to... allow me a moment of you know. My wife sometimes jokes is like you know, like I thought you Jews were good at money. So if I may, a moment of uh, marketing. Uh, Dog Brother Martial Art Association, www.dogbrothers.com, $30 a month, $300 a year. Give us two months, we'll have you hooked. Uh, I'm teaching I'm, out I'm, at the 37 PSR gun range, uh, which is Frankie McRae's gun range, which is in Bun Level. I am in the Southern Pines, Aberdeen area of North Carolina, which is at one end of uh, Fort Bragg. So uh, available for seminars and uh, there it is. So, uh, you know, if you folks join the association, I think you have a real good time, you know, closing in on 2000 bid lessons. And I'm always there. It's not one of these associations where there's a name and, you know, never to be seen. Yeah. You know, so I'm always there. That. I'm always available. OK, that's super important. Hey, Mark, um, afterwards, send me all the links. I'm going to put it at the bottom of this um, video. It's going to be on uh, it's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on Facebook. Certainly, certainly. I, I love your, I'm grateful for your contributions. I love your mind. I think I was saying, I, I quite enjoy observing you from a distance, even on social media. I think it's something, if I can call it a skill, I, as part of my life being, you know, this guy who travels around the world looking for extraordinary teachers, I think a part of that skill is being able to read between the lines, despite what can sometimes be this artificial filter of social media. So it's, it's amazing getting to talk to you. I hope to help to see you in person one day and we can. It would be my pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. The adventure, the adventure continues. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mark. Talk All to right, you soon. Well, out. What man. Whew. I feel like,
I feel like I need to smoke after that conversation. That was like a fire hydrant of knowledge and information and insight. Yeah. Not only to the dog brothers, um, not only to the Filipino martial arts, but uh, the human being that is Mark Denny. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Do me a favor. Um, I think this is super important. This interview is really important. So if you found value in it, uh, share it with somebody. Um, and, and this is the thing about these podcasts, right? There's, it, this is two hours long. There's something in this podcast that's going to be meaningful to somebody that you know and whose FMA or martial arts journey you care about. So if you were lucky enough to have joined us live, um, yeah, make, make note of those timestamps and uh, send it to a friend who might need to, to hear this. Because like I said, that was, that was a fire hydrant of information. So, hey, thank you guys so much. That was super dope for me. I hope to get to uh, talk with Mark in the future. I appreciate you guys. One love. Peace. See you soon. <laughs>